to have as a guest speaker former U.S. Air Force Sergeant and World War II Flyer, World War II German Prisoner of War, Yalmar Johansson. <laughs> Mr. Johansson was born in Hollywood, California, but he moved quickly to the East Coast. His widowed mom moved the family to New York City when he was just five months old, raised her in a Depression era uh, family by running a rooming house. Uh, when World War II began, Yalmar was just 17, still in high school. I believe he was itching to get into the war. A year later, by 18, he was a member of the Army Air Corps. Yalmar was assigned to a heavy bomber crew of B-24s as a nose gunner with the 15th Air Force 461st Bomb Group Squadron 767. In December 1944, during a mission to take out a refinery in Poland, Mr. Johansson's plane encountered German fighter planes, engaged in battle, was badly damaged and eventually crash landed in Austria. He was able to bail out, but while some of his crew was saved by Romanian partisans, he was picked up by the German army and became a prisoner of war. I'm not gonna tell you anymore. He can correct my errors, tell you the true story. Let's have him tell his story, which has been chronicled, by the way, on the History Channel. And I want to say one more thing about this man. He's a true American hero, one of the greatest generation, and we are proud that Mr. Johansson and his wife Mildred live right here in Morris County in Monville. Mr. Johansson. The only correction, Larry, is my, unfortunately, my, my wife passed away uh, nine years ago, and uh, that's heavy on my heart. But anyway, thank you, uh, Larry, and the rest of the crew, especially Ken and Sabrina, who arranged all this. Uh, I, first thing I'd like to say is what Memorial Day is, what it's all about. To start with, it's not about sales of cars or hot dog eating contests or the beginning of the summer season. It's about something that's much more important than that. It's about so many brave men and women who passed away and that we are here to honor them, their sacrifice. Just imagine if, uh, if we didn't win World War II. I was in World War II. Imagine why, what we would be thinking about doing right at this moment. Instead of getting into your car, you might not have had a car because the Germans were in charge. Let's imagine that the Germans and the Japanese beat us and we were all registered as alien enemy. And we wouldn't have a car probably to drive and we wouldn't have a home. Instead, we would have a number and we would be restricted. So that's what the future would have been like if we hadn't won World War II. I just did a very little bit in my contribution. More was done to me than I did to anyone else. But let me just explain pretty quickly because time is always of the essence. The, I'd like to just briefly uh, add to what Larry mentioned about my background. And incidentally, if you're really interested, uh, the History Channel has picked up my story. Uh, if you want to look, just Google my name, if you can spell it correctly. Uh, in the program, it's, it's spelled with an E-R, the first name. It's actually A-R. So if you Google my name, you, you'll get the wrong uh, address. But I was 19 years old when I 
sitting in my nose turret on a B-24 bomber. At that time, the, nose, the B-24 bomber was the largest bomber uh, in, in, in the heaviest bomber in the Air Force. Today, if you compare it to any of our regular jet airplanes, it was a pretty small animal. But at that time, it was uh, top of the line. And it was bigger than the B-17, which got a lot of extra credit for it. So I set out from our base in Italy on December 17, 1944. Uh, and uh, we gained altitude. Uh, the interesting part about it, about B-24 was that it didn't have any heat inside it. Uh, so when you got up to altitude, the temperature inside the airplane dropped to about 40 degrees below zero. We did have heated suits that kept us warm unless they shorted out. And we're climbing up, heading for the target. It was a long flight from Italy, Cerignola. And uh, we were flying in formation when unfortunately for me and for my bomber, some anti-aircraft fire hit us on the right wing, blew a hole about that big in size. And uh, immediately all the gasoline, that's where the gasoline was being stored, was flowing out. Uh, but right by a red hot engine, we had four engines. Finally, one of the engines caught fire. Then the next engine caught fire. Now there were two of them on. We started to lose altitude. We were, I thought to myself, uh-uh, I won't be going home in this plane. I wonder where I'll be headed for. And that was a good question at the time, the unknown. Finally, uh, the fighter planes, the German fighter planes were up. They told us there wouldn't be any because the Germans didn't have enough fuel at the time in late 1944. Well, uh, that didn't happen to be the case. Uh, this was a special deal. And we were pretty soon surrounded by ME 109s and FW 190 fighter planes and they strafed us from one end of the plane to the other. I could see them coming in on my turret. I was right up in the front, in front of the pilot, and, and running these 50 caliber machine guns. And anything that came near, I was trying to defend us. And finally, uh, either they ran out of ammunition or we lost enough altitude and they gave up on us, but we, we were going down. And the uh, pilot said, okay, get ready to bail out. Uh, you know, some kids when I go to school and give these talks, they uh, ask, uh, were you, the kids ask, were you scared to jump out of the plane? Answer to that is no, I was scared not to jump out. Because any time a plane went down and you were on board, if it went into a spin, you'd never get out. And the, when a plane went down, on average, one of these bombers, half of the crew of 10 perished. So the odds were against my survival at all. However, I did manage to uh, get my parachute on. That was a struggle, too, because my buddy who was supposed to help me out disappeared on me and uh, my parachute was lying uh, by, by the open door in the bottom of the plane, uh, which was the escape route. And all, I s recovered the fumble, racer, snapped it onto my harness and jumped right out. So was I scared to jump? No, I, I just wanted to get out of that airplane. And the Germans picked me up very quickly, and the parachute opened with a snap. And it's not like the uh, 
the, the parachutists that land in Yankee Stadium because they have special parachutes. But I was moving and came down and uh, hit the ground, which was covered with snow. Maybe that was a benefit, fortunately. But uh, I wasn't injured. I wasn't hit by it. And the plane had been riddled with enemy fire. Now, the Germans started picked me up almost immediately. The first question they asked was, uh, get, get the point now, I was 19 years old, and uh, I didn't look 19. So they wondered whether America was sending uh, children on bombers to bomb Germany. Uh, now you may think that's a compliment. To, uh, uh, how old do you think I am now? Uh, if you can't guess, how about 92? So, uh, and, and I'm still trying to move on. So, uh, the, the Germans had other ideas, and I was thrown into solitary confinement, put on a train to start with, uh, not very well treated, to say the least. Uh, started uh, a reducing diet, not of my own choice, but they just didn't feed me anything, and uh, it didn't matter what it was. In fact, I never had a knife or a fork for uh, five months I was in prison. Never had a knife. Why didn't I have a knife or a fork? I, there was never anything to cut or use a fork on. I had a tin cup on my belt, and when the food came, what, what so-called food, quotation mark, uh, came, you held out your mug, and somebody poured whatever was in that vat into your mug, and then you retreated back. I did have a spoon, though. And that, that was the way I lost 40 pounds in five months. So if you're interested, anybody wants to lose some weight, I, I can tell you all about it. Uh, now I, I put back a few pounds, so I'm back from uh, uh, 150 pounds. I'm almost 155, 158 now. And this uniform that I'm wearing is uh, the original uniform, 73-year-old uniform. How many of you guys got a piece of clothing that you could wear <laughs> that's 73 years old? And it doesn't look bad. I think it looks pretty sharp. <laughs> They made them good. Of course, in between that time, in order to stay svelte, uh, I did a little bit of running and a few other things, uh, but uh, that came to a halt. Now, the, let's get through the prison camp quickly because time is a wasting, and, and you want to hear all the stories, I think. Most of the kids uh, ask me, how did you get out? How did you get away from the Germans? Because I think I like that movie, The Great Escape, with uh, uh, Steve McQueen. Yeah, uh, that was all Hollywood baloney. <laughs> what he did. Uh, the, the only one that was fairly accurate movies was Starlock 17. I ended up in Starlock. Uh, Oh, I did it. My, I'll, I'll come back to that. The, the rain shuts down on occasions when, when you get to be 92 and above. Uh, but the Stalag turned out to be in very close to Berlin at the end of the war. And Berlin was a shambles at the time. We had bombed it completely, knocked it terribly out. And as a result, uh, camp I was in, Stalag 3A, 3A for Apple. That was the place I had about 17,000 prisoners in it, possibly more. Uh, some Americans, every nationality you could imagine was in there. And uh, the, I had one shower in five months. I never changed my clothing. He said, why, why didn't you change your clothing? I only had one set of clothes. And 
<laughs> I, if I washed it, this was winter time, and it was the coldest year, winter in, I don't know, 40 years. Uh, if I had washed my uniform, I'd be walking around in my all together, and uh, that would have been, I would have frozen stiff <laughs> that way. So uh, that clothing got close to me. It was also uh, filled uh, with residents that never left me. I, I was never lonesome at night when I hit the straw. We slept on straw. Uh, and the straw was filled with uh, little critters that uh, were looking for any sign of blood or anything else. And uh, uh, sure enough, there were lice and fleas and everything else. And if you settled down at night, tried to get to sleep, pull the threadbare blanket up over you, all of a sudden you start, oh, what's that? They were all coming to life, those little guys looking for a meal, and uh, I didn't have much to offer them. Anyway, we, kids then ask the next question, how did you get out? How, what, how did you get released? Did the Germans just let you go completely? Oh, first of all, let me add, I, I didn't cover that. There were 10 of us on the bomber to start with. I was the nose gunner right in the front. Saw so all the planes coming in that, we're coming in on the nose. And, uh, but there were 10 of us, and we all survived that particular problem, that going down. Uh, I tried to look them all up after the war and discovered that some of them had passed away. By this time now, uh, uh, after so many years had passed, uh, I'm the only survivor of that 10 man crew and uh, I'm trying to stay alive a few more years anyway. And uh, I'm going for 100, actually, so. <laughs> oh, yeah, but eight more to go. <laughs> and uh, as long as people are interested, I'll tell them my story. Okay, so how did I get out of it? Well, if, if you remember your history, the Battle of Berlin was the Russians were coming from the east uh, Americans, Patton and Marshall and the other Americans from the West. And uh, there was one way I knew exactly where they were. How is that possible? We had a clandestine radio. And believe me, that saved my life more than once, just knowing that it was there. Because some guy had some prisoner who had 24 hours a day with nothing to do, but he had in his head some ideas. And he constructed a, 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 a little radio. And he, he bribed the guards. Some of the guards in the prison camp were so old Germans that they were too old for World War I. So you can imagine how old they were. Uh, but the, and, and they didn't beat me or mistreat me. They didn't treat me with kid gloves or bring me a uh, birthday cake with candles on it either, but at, at least they left me alone. And now, uh, where, where was I? Uh, I was running off a track here. Uh, oh, yeah. The, uh, oh, the radio. Yeah, that was a marvelous bit. I didn't know about it at the time, except that I knew every night at a certain time from the British compound, which was adjacent to the American compound, they separated us by nationalities, that a little missile would come over and a guy would be waiting for it in a certain place. He'd catch it and inside it was a little piece of paper. And uh, then we'd say, okay, he's going to come in and we assembled all the guys in the barrack. My barrack, there were 144 guys in a pretty small room, which was good because there was no heat in the barrack anyway. And we, we just, animal heat kept us a little bit warm. Uh, but then we could sit down, we, we called it uh, 
as humorously the fairy tales because we didn't want the Germans to know that we had a radio contact because it would be held to pay if they found that. And they never did find it. But I, and I only knew about it because I read a book by a guy who had been a prisoner there and who knew all about the, where the radio was and where it was hidden. And I said to myself, I'm going to just relax as much as I can. Uh, where was I going to go anyway? I didn't speak German. I, I looked like a scarecrow in the clothing I had. I was a skeleton. Uh, I got down to about uh, 110 pounds at the end of it all. And uh, now how did I get out? Okay. One morning, the Russians were coming in from the east. And all of a sudden that night, before they came in, The German guards started marching out, carrying with them our Red Cross parcels, food, anything they wanted. They were scared to death of the Russians, and they had every right to be scared, because the way they treated the Russians, they, they literally killed the Russian prisoners, while at, at least the Americans and the British and some of the others were, were honored by the Geneva Convention. But the Russians didn't sign that treaty, and as a result, as a result, maybe I'm running over time. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll finish up shortly. But uh, the finally, the Russians, uh, Marshal Zhukov came in, put a pincer around Berlin, and dropped off some Russian guards that cleaned out our camp, they tore down the barbed wire, and uh, then we were told that we were now prisoners of the Russians. But the Russians were our allies. Oh yeah, well, somebody forgot to tell the Russians that. <laughs> These things happen. Uh, and literally the food got worse, which I didn't think it could, but uh, uh, then the story came around that the, the Russians were going to interview all of uh, American prisoners because we didn't know why, but you were not supposed to tell the, the Russians that you knew anything about mechanical equipment or anything about how to repair anything or, or whatnot. So instead, uh, and later we discovered that uh, the Russians had stolen or repatriated all this big heavy equipment from Germany that they didn't know what to do with. They didn't know how to operate it. So we, we, I was then confronted by this Russian, I think he was a colonel, spoke excellent English, rolled back in his chair and looked at me and said, uh, uh, tell me, uh, what what are you? What did you do? And I said I'm a student, which was true. I was going to engineering college for between 17 years of age when I graduated high school and 18. And uh, but I just said I'm, and the rest of them. And then the the Russian said, "That's amazing. I've never heard of such an army as the Americans have. You are so cultured." You're either all teachers, or painters, <laughs> or students, philosophers, but nobody knows anything. <laughs> Obviously, he, he, he knew what the story was, and he took it pretty well. I, I thought it was a pretty good idea. Uh, and then after that, it was uh, back, heading back to the States, back home. Uh, again, the... Uh, they transported us in uh, boxcars, and if you look at the uh, History Channel, you'll get a representation of that, although you really need to be in a boxcar without any seats or anything else. Piled so high that at night, while the guys fall asleep, they fall on top of you, and, and you struggle to get yourself out. And finally, the... 
get on a ship. I wanted to get home. They said, oh, hey, as long as you're here in France now, it was a French uh, base, which the Americans kept for re returning prisoners. They said, no, we can you can go to Paris if you want to, or if you want to go to London, we can arrange that. We'll fly you there. No, no, I want to go home. <laughs> uh, uh, later, I never regretted that at the moment I did, because I ended up in my uh, business world, uh, living five years in Paris, working there, and living in London for another two or three years, uh, also on business. So I, 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 never, I didn't miss out on London or Paris uh, or any of the other countries that I visited. But uh, coming on that Liberty ship, and that was a joke, they said, you know, these Liberty ships have a habit of breaking in half. And when they do it, <laughs> you better have a life preserver on. Now, that didn't happen. Instead, I came into New York Harbor, and uh, since I was a New York City resident uh, prior to the war, that was my hometown. <laughs> and uh, I saw the skyscrapers looming, and I looked at the ship was heaving a little bit and then sure enough into sight comes Lady Liberty and all those years uh, I knew she was out there I never bothered with Lady Liberty and I never paid much attention to it until this time as I sailed by I looked up at her with her torch and I said now I know what Liberty is and you only know it after you've lost it. So if be thankful for what you have, your liberty, what you have, the home life that you have, uh, say a little prayer if necessary. And uh, so that about ends up my story. I think I've taken long enough. It's probably too long, they'll say. You won't come back again, that's for sure. <laughs> but. Uh, Thank you for listening, and God bless you. Thank you so much, Mr. Johnson.